everybody, this is Billy Howardell, and you're watching Premier Guitars Big Five. So what's my favorite guitar? Um, I guess the guitar I always play, which is a 1960 reissue Les Paul, uh, 60 classic. It's got some Tom Anderson pickups in it. It's been through many battles. It was a guitar I got from as a gift from Trent Reznor when I was his guitar tech in 94 and 5. It was kind of a in, in scraps and kind of put it together to make it work and before I could really afford a proper guitar. So it kind of um, got kind of molded into favor over the years with uh, a couple little upgrades here and there. It had standard Les Paul uh, pickups. I then put in these Tom Anderson pickups that I actually got uh, because I worked for Fishbone before Nine Inch Nails and Kendall Jones, a guitar player, used those pickups and I really liked them. They're very exact and mid uh, precise, a little more surgical sounding than the uh, soft breakup of a lot of classic pickups. So I kind of like that. It gave a little bit of range and I could always soften it up and do all that stuff in post or you know with my guitar processing and I just felt like uh, it gave me more latitude. There's a cap or something in the in the volume knob that it crosses with the tone that when you roll down the volume it doesn't lose, it doesn't get muddy, right? So it just kind of thins out as I roll down and that's key to I think the way I play, especially in Perfect Circle where I'm doing a lot of volume work. I'm, I'm kind of a turning down to clean up quite a bit and without that I think pickups just get muddy. They get, you know, uh, too much low end, but these clean up really nicely and just have that. I can kind of play clean on my neck pickup and, and go down with full volume on the on the lead pickup and it'll, you know, be like two different settings. It's kind of forego a, a distortion pedal. <laughs> The only other thing I'd say about this guitar is it's a mess. I mean, if you've seen interviews with me with it before, it's uh, it's got this little lovely thing. So the, it's it's Cineburst in color, and with Trent, I went through, I've written it down and I memorized it. It was 137 Les Pauls, I believe, in 1994 and 5. So this was, to me, the best sounding one, but the headstock got ripped off. He threw it, broke, someone stole it, or, you know, got thrown in the crowd, someone, uh, I guess accidentally fell in their pocket, took the headstock off. And so I found another one of similar color, but put it on at the wrong angle. And it's kind of to this day, for whatever reason, I guess that relief is pretty shallow, straight, whatever you want to say. Um, but it still has a tack. I mean, it's a guitar I use for everything. So it's great. It's also got this little war wound, which is awful. And the other kind of funny thing is the first day of me being a tech for Trent, I put it down on the table to um, to just do some soldering on something and I dropped the soldering iron right there. And I was so bummed. I was like, oh my God, I'm fired from this job before I even start. I mean, know it. And the tech next to me said, you, you know, you don't know what you're in for. This was before I had even seen, well, I had seen Nine Inch Nails once before, but it was so chaotic and smoky and strobe that I, I couldn't even make out what was going on. And then I realized, oh my God, yeah, there's very little care goes into those guitars that uh, the aesthetic care is not, or the uh, cosmetic care should be kind of ignored. Everyone assured me it wasn't even worth mentioning. This is like, you know, uh, going to work at a flamethrower factory and dropping a match on the floor. They'd be like, look, it's, it's okay. It was just complete utter destruction then. So yeah, it was just breaking guitars night after night and I go through one to seven a night. So yeah, I got good at fixing them eventually and just wound up using Bondo, honestly, because it was the quickest to deal with. After like, like half the body was gone on some of these. It's funny because I get particular about things and sometimes really not particular about things like just whatever. I kind of like molding bad things into shape. Um, but I can say that I could hear the difference in a Les Paul to other guitars, even other guitars that we had tried out. They just, for what we were doing there, for, especially for what Nails was doing, it was like full assault distortion. And it was on and off. It wasn't nuanced, you know? So for that, it was really good. But I've found that just, I don't know, to me, Les Paul just sounds great. And not every Les Paul sounds the same. That one just sounds a little better than most have heard. But a little better. I mean, you know, if I picked one up and you handed me one, I, I don't know if I would tell the difference if it had the same pickups. But night after night when you're playing parts or, you know, certainly after an hour or two, you would, it starts to become pretty clear that there's something to it. Desert Island album, 
I should be able to answer this so easy. How many times have I been asked that? Um, Kings of the Wild Frontier by Adam Ant, I'd say, if I have to really put one, one album. I think it's the album I've listened to the most consistently since it came out. I was 10 in 1980, and that was, that was the record that's kind of stuck with me throughout. I think it's the most adventurous, amazing, creative, forward, weird record I had heard or have heard. What's my biggest guitar culture pet peeve? I don't know if a pet peeve, but it's an observation. I have kids, and as they're, you know, trying to put a guitar in their hand, and they get to the age of 10, and then they see some other kid who's seven, who's a virtuoso, and they think it's too late for them. And I think there's too much that comparison, and that probably goes for beauty or, you know, whatever it is across the board in social media that we're just not... We're not really designed to uh, deal with this social experiment of social media, right? It's just, it's got some horrible consequences. It's got obviously great fun and convenient and entertaining things, but one is just comparing yourself to everything else out there. And I think that the, my pet peeve would be to see someone giving up on playing because they, they're not going to be that phenom player. Which guitar hero might shock or surprise you? I think... Um, East Bay Ray from Dead Kennedys. It's probably one of the first ones that comes to mind. Before I picked up a guitar, but right as I was starting to play, um, was, I would say, borderline obsessed with Dead Kennedys. East Bay Ray's guitar was amazing to me. It was, a, and it, I wasn't into surf, you know, surf 50s guitar culture sounding things, but there was something about the, the way they stitched it all together and, the, the, you know, the humor and, you know, message of Jello with the, this grinding punk and I wasn't the biggest punk fan again uh, across the whole genre but there were certain things that really were awesome to me and that was a that was a band that was that and Joe Walsh is another big one I, I just have always liked Joe Walsh's playing tasteful and you know there was he's got a great sense of humor if you've ever seen him in interviews and things and for some reason I make that connection with his playing not that it's <laughs> He's not playing cartoon music, but it's just, there's something really wholesome and amazing. I think he's like, a, you know, American treasure. For me, it's just like knowing enough to be able to communicate musically, but not enough to get in my own way and get in muscle memory patterns, or I'm, I'm sure I am in many muscle memory patterns, but into a place where I'm still searching for what that note is up there, and I really don't know, and I don't want to know. If there's a mantra that I kind of follow that I should probably write down and put on top of my desk. It's a, I was a big Elvis Costello fan. In an interview, I heard him say, you know, you wanna take a left-handed fretless bass in the dark and write your next record, you know? And just, so if you read between the lines of that, I've kind of tried to stay in that mode of like not having, you know, I use Logic Audio, but I don't have a template. I really do start everything from the laborist point of ground zero, just a, a clean slate default you know, layout. And sort of same with guitars. I don't save a lot of presets and copy them to next songs. I kind of start from scratch. I think that, if anything, may, might be my secret weapon, just, you know, not getting too caught in preset world. Keep the struggle to a point where you're not trying to tap out. You know, just you're kind of hold, in this holding pattern between frustration and um, getting excited on something that you forgot how to do. Cast out this fear